Welcome everyone to Dishwasher Diaries. I'm Steve Crone. This is the podcast where we discuss all topics, essential, tangential, and most of the time utterly irrelevant to the controversial subject of loading your dishwasher. Our guest today is my new friend, the wonderful Simon Friend. Uh, Simon runs Simon Friend Productions. He produces some wonderful West End theater. He's recently moved into film and television as well. He founded his company in 2015. Before that, he was producer at Theater Royal Bath. Simon Friend Productions has produced lots of great shows, including Life of Pi, which very recently won five Olivier's, including Best Play. Um, the Father, the wonderful film and stage play um, by Florian Zeller. Other shows include Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, Bad Jews, The Grinch Musical, and many others. We will talk to him about all of that. We will also, of course, talk to him about loading the dishwasher. But before we do any of that, I will play you our wonderful theme song. Feel free to sing along. Do you wash my hand or buy a machine? Do you rinse your dish or do you leave it in the sink soaking? Dishwasher queries for people all over the world. Bring your questions then. Come and meet my friends. Dishwasher Diaries. Have you ever cleaned up your food trap? Have you ever researched all the brands of the product you're using? We will investigate the best way to dry your plates. Bring your questions there. Come and meet my friends, Dishwasher Diaries, Dishwasher Diaries. Simon, welcome. Usually the very first thing we talk about is loading the dishwasher, but before we do that, I think we have to explain the wonderful sucking sound that people may hear in the background. You are literally feeding your three month old son, Gabriel, as we speak. I am indeed. Uh, my, um, my wife usually does the feed at this time of day, of course, but, uh, but uh, she has just left for a bachelorette weekend for her, for her youngest sister. And so it's just me doing a podcast, feeding the baby. I love it. I love it. Um, so as is our tradition, before we get into uh, all of those Olivia Awards that will be on your mantle soon, if you don't have them already, um, I I've got to ask you about loading the dishwasher, because that's what we do here. Sure. Um, who loads the dishwasher in your household? Is it, is it, a, is it a team effort? Is it you? Is it your lovely wife? How, how does that go down in the friend household? It's both of us. Uh, we we clean up after ourselves, really. Uh, and I'm the less organized one. It's a bit mm -hmm. haphazard. Um, I think the key to loading a dishwasher is to understand the curvature of the of the crockery <laughs> or the item that you're putting in there. Because if you put a bowl behind a plate, you're not. There's nowhere to put anything behind the bowl. But if you put the bowl in front of the plate. Then, then that's fine because you can put stuff in front of the bowl. That's my philosophy on dishwasher practice. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty practical. Now, you mentioned you eat. It sounds like you each kind of load your own dishes. 
Is there is there any um, disagreement about the way that should be done? You just described one little piece of logic there. Are you guys in harmony about this? Is is anybody like rearranging the other ones? Loading? How, how, what, yeah. What's that look like? I think I think Jennifer, my wife, is rearranging my loading more than the other way around. Uh, we try to, you know, be environmentally friendly. We're not going to put it on when it's not full. Yeah. Uh, unless there's something really bad in there, in which case we would. But that's not that often. Um, <laughs> and, but, yeah, she's more meticulous than me. I think it also, it's, 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 you've got to make sure you don't put anything too big in there because that's when you foul the, the, the spinny thing. And then, and then it the doesn't clean spray anything. Arm. That's, that, the spray arm, when you put something a bit too tall in the bottom compartment, which I don't know if you've done, but that is a major faux pas in dishwasher loading. Uh, that then, it, and, and yeah, that's maybe the worst crime one can do in dishwasher loading, actually. There are because worse you make ones. the entire cycle pointless, really. It, it's not there a good thing, ones. but I, well, there are worse ones. I will tell you in our, in our, in our over six months of discussing loading the dishwasher every single day, and we've alluded to it in prior installments of the podcast, we actually found three news stories for reasons which we're still trying to figure out, all from Australia, where people fell into their dishwasher and were killed, uh, impaled. So I would say that's about the biggest faux pas. Actually dying in your dishwasher is even worse than blocking the spray arm. Uh, but blocking the spray arm is pretty bad. That to um, me sounds like a terrible, a terrible domestic anecdote from a, <laughs> from a court case. Yes, they died at home. That's like the staircase, but even worse. Because I can't it's unbelievable. imagine how, how you do that. It is unbelievable. I would, Three I would of them. question that. If, that was a, if that's an alibi. It, it, uh, that's, oh, that's interesting alibi. that's interesting this could be uh a, a, in one of your future plays um i think they all like fell on knives or something else sharp that probably went like through their eye or something really grisly um okay last couple of dishwasher questions before the dishes go in you mentioned running it if there's something particularly nasty in there are they rinsed off are they just scraped off? Like, how clean or dirty are they when they go into the dishwasher? Oh, I have no consistency there. It depends what mood I'm in. <laughs> it depends how busy I am to get wherever I'm after I've eaten. Uh, it's yeah, uh, I, it's all over the place. Yeah, that, that's the that's the that's the answer to that. Sometimes, sometimes very clean. I know some people would say, well, if you're putting it in there, what are you wasting water? On, on rinsing it for and that would be that's you know, i'm in that camp. If we're thinking if we're thinking environmentally then i'm in that uh, camp it's called a dishwasher so i figure it actually can wash your dishes you don't have to wash them first yeah, and if it can't and if it can't wash your dishes properly then you need a new dishwasher yep really simon perfect yeah. okay last question we always ask this question um i'm assuming for purposes of this question that you have sort of baskets that your utensils stand up in and not a tray at the top the knives no, before a tray at the top oh well i'm glad i prefaced it with top. that so you don't have to deal with sharp side up sharp side down everything's laying down at the top no that's right Done. we used to have one of those ones with the basket but we got the one with the top and it changed my life so um, <laughs> i'm happy to uh to continue with the one at the top for the for the rest of my days. I would never go back to that basket thing. Terrible, terrible piece of manufacturing. Terrible design. In practice, that's not, how you die. When you've got that, a nice think, face up, you wouldn't do that with the top tray. You know, that's this is a good point. There. The third tray definitely saves lives. At least it would have saved at least two or three in Australia. So let's turn to your wonderful work. The hot news, I guess, semi-hot news, it wasn't so long ago, your current production or one of your current productions, Life of Pi, I think most people around the world, of course, know the movie, but they may not know, unless they've been to the West End, that you've turned it into 
a live play and it won best play five Olivier's have, have first of all, I hate to focus on the awards, but let's focus on the awards for a minute. Ha, have you received your Olivier's in the mail yet? Or are you still waiting to get them? Or did you take them home with you it that actually, night? In the UK, it works very differently. Producers are vastly undervalued. Even if like Life of Pi, where I optioned the rights on that, commissioned it from scratch, put together the entire team and put it, you know, everything. Regardless, the producer is not honored in the way that they are in, what? in New York theater. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So the best play is specifically for the playwright. Now, Lalita Jacobati, a magnificent writer, uh, and she is very graceful about the entire the development of this production and would never um, uh, solely focus on herself because she's a, a, a generous woman and a very talented woman. So so she uh, she in any press she does makes that very, very clear that it's a it's very much been a collaborative production. Um, but the five awards we got were the best play and the rest were design awards oh, and acting awards. But one of the acting awards was a curious one where for the first time it went to seven very skillful uh actors who are who who specialize ah. in physical theater in movement and so they won best supporting actor even though some of them are are uh women or identify as women uh they won the the uh best supporting actor award for the part of richard richard parker which if for people who know the story would know that richard parker is the tiger um and to Collaboratively, we won Best Actor for the for the uh, the actor Hiran Abeskera who played Pi, and uh, and then Best Supporting Actor for seven seven individual actors, uh, seven men and, and women. Got their who, award, who, which is great. For them. That's really cool. So let's talk about that. That's really cool. So let's talk about that a little. I think most people are familiar with the novel and the movie, but just in case, um, Pi is essentially for a large chunk of the story on a boat in the middle of the sea with a tiger on the boat with him. And obviously you have to bring that back to life on stage in a very different way than it's done in the film with CGI, of course. Now, the only time I've seen that sort of thing is War Horse, which I did see in the West End. Tell us a little more about that process for Life of Pi. I mean, that's obviously very uh, unique. Our designer, um, our movement director, the guy who 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 uh, uh, directs the actors to uh, understand the movement of animals and to uh, f- sort of to, to to physically animate these puppets was actually in the original War Horse. He was a puppeteer himself in the in the joey the horse and he broke away from that and he started to be to to go into directing and also he co-designed the puppets because they take on a very specific uh, kind of artistic aesthetic that he developed with the other puppetry designer um nick barnes and uh so that was worked out in immense detail uh through a series of of long workshops and how are we going to um, make these animals uh, convince on stage because in some the success it's, it would only work if we get the audience to a point that they know they're watching a piece of artifice they know they're watching theater but they need they, there are no stakes if there's no fear because a lot of life of life for anyone who's seen the film or read the book uh, a, a part of well one of the themes is about is 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 fear um and so they do genuinely uh instill this fear and in, in, uh, in the audience but because because they need to believe the stakes are high enough that pi is on this boat and he's he could be killed by this tiger and and all theory and all logic would mean that he will be killed by this tiger yeah uh, so no. it it, there can't be anything childlike about these puppets. They need to be, uh, they need to be fierce, which is what they are. Fierce. You, know, you get that if you believe, if you believe you're watching a tiger. So I, I haven't seen the show yet. And by the way, we should mention the show is coming to the States. I know that you're previewing uh, at Harvard we're and then in, coming to New rehearsal. York. 
When does the We're show Boston right now in Boston? Oh, so when does the show open in Boston? Uh, December fourth, and it runs to December to January twenty ninth. Terrific, uh, and then you so move December to New York. Weeks, and then, yeah, terrific. Later. So I want to go back to the puppets for a second. So again, I haven't seen the show yet. I've seen some film clips. To what extent? Obviously, as you said, you got to believe the tiger. To what extent are the actors who won that award supposed to be invisible on stage? And to what extent, even though the tiger is the character, are they acting with their bodies so that in some even subliminal way, they're also communicating with the audience in their own body or, or are they supposed to completely it's, disappear? It's, it's the latter, Steve. If we wanted them to disappear, uh, well, firstly, that would be very hard, but you know, you'd put them in blacks, you'd put them, uh, I don't know, a balaclava on them or something. The idea, they're wearing fairly light colored clothing. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing which is attempting to put them into the background. You just, it's about um, imagination and belief, which actually is another core uh, component and, and theme of the novel. So you are invited to believe, which is not a, not something that uh, you can do on film. Film is a very literal medium. In the film, if they hadn't created a magnificent CGI tiger, uh, well, there would be no other option uh, because you can't exactly tame a tiger to use them on a film set. So, uh, uh, or at least not in the way that they need to use this. Yeah. One. So. That that is that's what theatre provides for this. So, with regards to the animals, um, uh, we see the puppeteers. They make the noises. They are trained to understand animal noises and exact and, and but also at different times. You know, how how do you how how do you begin to think what a seasick orangutan? What noise does a seasick <laughs> orangutan make? Maybe that should be the subject of another podcast. The, <laughs> the seasick orangutan. But the fact uh, that, I've been, know, we can guess I've been a, called worse. We can guess what a seasick orangutan would sound like, um, and they uh, uh, and they are they are operating this very sophisticated puppet. But at the same time, we see them. We see their faces, and their faces um, replicate what we would expect from a. Sorry, I'm sorry, Steve. You can probably hear a baby in the background, can't you? G uh, Gabriel is fine. We love Gabriel. If you need to stop at any point. Don't hesitate. No, no, no. I think we're good. I think we're good, but he likes to be held. So I'll just. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Um, so uh, you see, the, the, they are, as you, as you just assumed in your second uh, description of what they might be like, they are, they are as one. After a certain amount of time, and it really, you'd be surprised how quick it happens when you're actually focusing on a show like this, as happened in Warhols, the success of it is that, you believed there were horses there, even though that, that puppetry was far more abstract because they were kind of sticks and, you know, uh, well, not sticks. I'm sure that's hugely undervaluing what they were doing. But it was it was a much more lit, much more abstract representation of an animal than we have, as are also abstract in that there's, it's made out of um, uh, they're made out of a, a material called plastizote and uh, which is kind of carved to look like uh, uh, driftwood. Because the boat, mm. a boat on a sea, you know, essentially detritus on the on an ocean, and they're carved mm -hmm. to be to look as if they've been constructed out of out of driftwood. But at the same time, they've also got bungee cords to make them elastic, to make the muscle movements feel uh, authentic. So it's uh, yeah, they're, they're they're incredibly sophisticated pieces of sculpture, really. Uh, you know, I always think. People's association when you, or people's assumption when you use the word puppet is, you know, the Muppets or something like that. Again, I'm not denigrating right. them. I think they're very uh, sophisticated with what they do as well. Um, but it's just, it's a different art, a different art yep. form. So I, I, I want to broaden out a little. It, you certainly, it's not the only thing you do in terms of theater, but you have developed a sort of unique specialty in bringing film properties to the stage, sometimes as musicals, but often as um, stage plays, non-musicals. Did that just evolve by happenstance? Was it part of a vision you had 
tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, in I think it's it's in the UK we have a history of of theatre going which is non musical. Um, I know musical theatre certainly in the commercial space uh, in the US, be it in New York or or on the touring circuit in North America, is very very focused on musicals. In fact, there are very few shows that you can tour which aren't musicals certainly touring in a commercial sense um yeah. life of pi i hope is one of them and we're certainly in advanced discussions about that um already but uh um i so it, but in the uk it's a very different palette uh touring musicals is certainly done a lot it's enormously expensive um and the risk is massive uh because of that if they don't go well then you can really find yourself in a in a quite deep hole play and i've done it before i've done it we've done it well we've had shows like as with everyone we've had shows that have gone tremendously well we've had shows that haven't um <laughs> with plays it's a it's a slightly different market generally speaking a slightly older market but also i'd say a more reliable one um mm-hmm. so i feel that there is the um and, and in the uk a significant one as well as opposed to the appetite for uh, a, a non-musical play on the road in a in a in a two thousand seat theatre. You know that rarely mm-hmm. happens. Whereas here it happens the whole time. But right now we're presenting the best exotic Marigold Hotel in the Theatre Royal Norwich, which, if not two thousand seats, is not far off. Maybe it's eighteen hundred, so something like that. Um, and it's going it's going really well. It's an uplifting story. Uh, I, d- I don't know how um, impactful the film was in the us but it was huge in the uk but also now the theme of it regardless of the value of the ip the theme of uh it's about a group of british retirees who find themselves unable to afford retiring in the uk so they go to uh to india to a hotel that is advertising itself as being essentially a retirement home for uh british seniors and it couldn't have been when I started out with the project with um, uh, Deborah Mogger, who's the novelist who has uh, she wrote the novel that, that inspired the film. And she also wrote the screenplay for the for Pride and Prejudice, the Kira Knightley version in 2005. And she was she wrote the novel and the screenplay for Tulip Fever, which was a movie a few years ago, which was uh, it didn't make it to screens. I think it was caught up in the. Uh, in the Weinstein debacle um, and various other, she's got, she's an enormously talented um, novelist and dramatic writer um, and a very, very nice person as well. Anyway, uh, in, in collaborating with her on it, uh, when we started, the UK wasn't in the situation it's in now. And I don't know how widely reported this is in um in the US, but there's a you know fairly severe cost of living crisis over here at the moment because of uh, because of many things. But I suppose when just talking about you know, people being able to afford to heat their homes, it's because of uh, energy which is uh, restricted because of the war at the, in 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 Ukraine at the moment. So, uh, but but that's just one of many factors. Uh, but it has it's become incredibly prescient this story of um of people not being able to afford to live and also so that's the sort of practical element of it but also yeah. uh, the social element of of younger people dismissing the older person in life and finding um uh that they shirk them and then they're just unwanted which is very much not the social um uh, status in India where the older person will always be the most respected one in the room and I'm actually I'm working on an adaptation of um, I haven't announced it yet but here we go here's the live announcement I don't know how excited oh breaking there, news there's a an, there's an amazing amazing Japanese film which is regarded as one of the greatest films ever made called Tokyo Story maybe of course some of Ozu. your listeners in t- Yes, Ozu, that's right. And I saw it during the pandemic. To my shame, I hadn't seen it before. But we had a lot of time to kill during the pandemic, so we watched our house Japanese films from the 50s. Um, but also, of course, <laughs> one of in, to, to cinephiles, one of the most famous films of all time. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful story, similar, although in a very, told through a very different lens, to Marigold Hotel. 
in that it's about older people who come from uh, the provinces to the cities and are shirked off. It could almost be the story that happened to these people who've gone to India to retire before they went to India. This is the reason they've gone away, because they go yeah. to the cities and they get they get passed between their children, their children being in their 40s and 50s, who are wanting to sort of do an hour with them and then move on with their life. And um, and it's I think it's a it, it's the subject for a beautiful piece of drama. And it's also for anyone who hasn't seen the film, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a I think one of the most profound images at the end of it of uh, manifesting how life moves on. It's just a, 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 a boat sailing down a river and it holds yeah. the camera holds there. And it just for far longer than it needs to, but actually not longer than it needs to, because that sort of you go to understand that's the point of the film is that whatever happens in these people's lives, the world keeps going, the world keeps going. So, yeah. um, uh, and and unfortunately, it's going past these 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 retirees, um, but they are clinging on, um, and so I'm actually very creatively fulfilled by uh, Marigold Hotel as well as commercially. Thankfully, it's. Um, People are people are turning up for it, which is great. Fantastic! I, yeah, I'm fascinated in traveling around the world. The difference in um, sort of intergenerational relationships in various countries, and even in different sort of demographics within a country. Um, you know, like you said, I mean, very different in India versus England, the UK, Japan. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Brazil, and they are sort of intergenerational social events are, are a much bigger thing than they seem to be in a lot of uh, in a lot of parts of the states. I want to go back, though, to my question again. You focused, and I'm so glad you did, on the uh, play versus musical aspect. But can you also talk a little bit about the movie aspect? Again, it seems you've done, I don't know how many, uh, four, five, six shows yeah. that are all if not based on films, were turned into films. Because as you pointed out, in some cases, it's a novel that was the source material for both the film and your play. How did that happen? Is it, was that a plan or I, were you just I, drawn I, I to those properties? Every, Steve, I think in every case, but I've done, I've done, I think five or six. I, I could, but in every case, it's, I'm just looking at the posters. And in every case, it's been uh, it's been a, a novel which has been turned into a film. Uh, as, Got it. You know, we won't go into the we won't go into the details, but that's how you and I know one another. Um, and uh, it is um, it, it in some in some instances, if we're talking the business of that. The no, the novelist has uh, retained stage rights. In uh, also in another instance, I've made a film that has been adapted from a play. So that was where um, uh, we had produced it in in the West End, had licensed it to be produced on Broadway, and then made the film of it. Um, but specifically on the novel to stage route, where films have been involved, therefore where obviously studios have been involved. Um, yeah. The often, well, probably half half of them have been some active collaboration with a studio, and the other half have been. Uh, it just happened that the novelist had managed to to carve out retain the, those rights, uh, st the stage rights. That's right. Yeah. Got it. So I want to. You you alluded just now to the father. I really want to talk about the father. So I have of course seen the film multiple times. Just phenomenal. I've, I, I really want to see the play. Um, for those not familiar, and uh, uh, so Florian Zeller wrote the play, right? I think it's originally produced in French. Uh, and it's a story involving uh, Anthony Hopkins plays the father in the film. Olivia Coleman plays his daughter. And um, he is um, struggling with Alzheimer's and, and it, the film does it in an amazing way. I've heard about how the, the stage play does it. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not sure I have a specific question here. I just want to talk about this amazing work because when I saw the film, I was so blown away by the way that was 
portrayed visually. I know they couldn't do it exactly the same on stage. So I, I started reading articles about the way it was done on stage because I didn't have an opportunity to see the play. So having, having produced both the play and the film, just open-ended, tell us a little bit about The Father. I mean, I thought it was just an extraordinary film. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I would agree. Um, and specifically on your question about how it was done on stage, we I should say it started when uh, we did it in a small studio um, and in, 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 in the west of England uh, called, called the Theatre Royal Bath in a 125-seat um, theatre where the production values and the production budget were, were small. Um, but that said, it, it's one of it was a, with a wonderful designer, a wonderful stage designer who's one of the most highly regarded in the English speaking world now. I think uh, called, called Miriam Buther, uh, and she what it's what I'm endlessly impressed by is when designers manage to use um, manage to create such brilliance from so lim such limited resources. And this is one of the moments, and I would say, actually, just going on to the film, the exact same thing applies. Because Peter Francis, who designed the film, designed the whole thing, I would say, in four weeks. Um, wow. And we built it in two. Um, and wow. so it was, it, as, uh, so it was, it was really utterly remarkable. Uh, but on the, on the stage, it, what became, um, clear. The, the reason it became clear that the, the father could have been a film is because the, the theatrical um, devices, which were used as sort of sleight of hand or trickery on stage, not in a gimmicky way, but really truly reflective of the plot of somebody losing their mind, and that you start with a fully furnished room and gradually you don't really notice it necessarily, but you work your way to a blank canvas uh, mm -hmm. because that's essentially, of course, a representation of the landscape of his completely blank mind at the point where he doesn't even know who he is. Sorry, I've just ruined the film for people, but I think you can tell it's going that way from the first moment. Um, so uh, it worked by way of, you know, really lo-fi walls being taken away by stagehands, um, uh, bits of furniture being pulled back and you don't see it, but, uh, um, you know, blackouts and then, had, we had a big rim of lighting which blinded the audience while uh, while some of this was happening. So no one could see it, but it also, it, it, that blinding effect was meant to be a feeling of severe discomfort. Because, sure, because that, disorientation. That's what this, that's what this man, disorientation is maybe the better word for it, yes. So that's exactly what um, uh, uh, it was... Um, it was always reflective of his mental state at the time. So it was enormously theatrical in its telling of that, but where, where and it was fairly abstract and the same, it was a similar ish design to Paris, but Parisian design, I've seen quite a lot of theater in Paris, but the designs all seem fairly consistent in their lots of sliding panels. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all very chic, but regardless what play you might be seeing a bawdy sex comedy. <laughs> or um, or a very or or a piece of hemi drama, and it's almost as if the sets have been the same. <laughs> um, if there are any French French scenic designers watching, they might send me hate mail and say uh, <laughs> that's not great. But I'm just it's just my experience. Um, and so, the, but what became clear, and I should say actually, as that production grew and we moved it into the West End, uh, the, the design really stayed very much the same. Um, and it, it it slightly expanded, but but really it was it was mostly the same. And the the reason which I knew it, why when Florian said he was very keen to do a film of it, my initial response was, was well, when you look at the history of plays adapted into film, especially plays which are single location. Now this you could argue it's single location. You could argue it's all in a hospital. And the rest of it's in his mind. You could argue it's all in his flat or it's all in her, her flat, uh, apartment, sorry. Or, you know, you're not quite sure where it is, but it, it could be done in a single place. The, 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 I guess the obvious um, uh, concern would be, is that going to be really stagey and unwatchable on film as we've, you know, I think we've all seen a few of those in the past where you think this is just, sure. uh, you've essentially, you've, you've put a play on a soundstage and then you filmed it. 
Um, but this was regard. So the te- where I've seen people try to get away from that is they break it out, they make it multi-location where it wasn't before, and even that sometimes can feel stagey because of the dialogue. But this was using the theatrical devices uh, used on stage as finding uh, of replicating this uh, man's mental state um, uh, through theatre. This was finding a cinematic equivalent of that. And that was what he was convinced that there, then the cinematic equivalent of that was actually a game. It's sleight of hand. Um, it was, yeah. it was, it was editing, which was beautifully done, but it, it, not nothing revelatory. It was just a fairly original uh, way of editing a scene. I'm sure it's not the first. Um, the, I'm sure we weren't the first to do that. But it would, you would think you're watching an a. a you think you're watching a character played by one actor, but actually you realize that that character might be a different actor, or we might be uh, watching something entirely different because you are essentially immersing the audience in the feeling that this discomfort of, um, of uh, losing your, um, your bearings completely. Yeah. It's, it's extraordinarily cinematic. I mean, I think it's, it's, it doesn't feel like a play at all, really. Um, so I got to ask you about working with these two actors. I mean, I get, I, I think the argument could seriously be made that you were working with the finest actor of his generation, period, in Anthony Hopkins, and the finest actor of her generation in Olivia Coleman. I mean, these are I, I mean, just two of the most extraordinary and I don't want to give short shrift to the other supporting folks in the cast, but those two actors are literally two of the finest actors alive. Mm. What was that they like? They are. They are. Uh, magnificent. An honor to, uh, to, to be there and watch, watch the magic happen. Um, especially for, uh, especially for Hopkins, as you know, it really is his, his, um, it's that character's film in that it's his story. It's, it's, uh, I guess to a degree, you could say, well, if it's called the father, it needs to be, uh, somebody's father. Therefore, is it actually the daughter's story? Because otherwise it would just be called Anthony, which was his character's name in the film. Um, so it, it is the father daughter relationship to a degree, but also, but, but probably more so, um, about him and to watch that, um, to watch that, uh, the, the the acting prowess of a man losing his marbles, um, but in a very minor key. Uh, you know, it wasn't ever showy at all. Because, and I have seen a showy production of it, um, which I was a showy production of the play, which I was really deeply unimpressed by. Which has, you know, the old sort of the way Eugene O'Neill plays end with somebody just crying into their hands at the end. It's not about that. That's not how to tell the story at all because it doesn't make any sense because you don't know enough to cry into your hands um, that, that, that you've lost everything. You need to have your bearings to understand that. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's, and that's the beautiful, but the very upsetting tragedy of it. Um, the quite how under, uh, how, 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 um, in, in what in such a minor key that it is performed uh, to the almost it could be conversational it's so casual and if yeah. anyone who's seen the film the final the final moment which is almost uh, unwatchingly uh, 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 sort of uh, just too painful to even watch so I say this is I'm I'm trying so to heartbreaking uh, pacifier into my, um, it 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 was um incredibly uh, a difficult place to go to as an actor. So to watch that happen um, and you could see, you know, to, to be going to a very dark place personally is yeah. uh, an honor to watch an artist perform at that, you know, at that caliber. Yeah. It's a, it's an amazing performance. I want to open it up to our friends. Like I mentioned at the outset, some of the dishwasher diaries gang are huge theater aficionados and fans. Um, uh, But I have one more question, and that is, this may include some of your shows, but I suspect it may also include some others. What are are some of your favorite plays or musicals as someone who's been doing this for 
a long time. Do you have some personal favorites as far as shows or, or, or playwrights or musicals? Yeah, I'd say my most memorable experiences in the theater are, there are two, and that's a show which has recently been on Broadway, which was the Lehman Trilogy, um, with uh, Simon Russell Beale, be, um, Amazing Ben Miles, and Adam Godley. Um, and um, not only performances, you're obviously watching three world-class actors, but you're also watching, a Sam Mendes directed it, uh, Ez Devlin, Incredible. who's more known really for her, for her sort of uh, big rock concerts, really designed it. Um, and every every element of that, I'd say that has the second best video projection I've ever seen in theater. The best, of course, is Life of Pi, but everyone will need to see that. But <laughs> it was um, it was it it was just magnificent from start to finish. And while so many plays and films are way too long nowadays, that was I think from memory maybe three hours fifteen, three and a half. I could have watched another three hours of it. I just was it was it was as if watching a binging on a box set, but but without even going to the bathroom, it was amazing. Um, uh, and I love it. it. It returns to the West End next year, and I'm certainly I will be seeing it again. Um, and the other, and this is maybe a really controversial thing to say, um, but one of the most formative memories of uh, theatre going for me is uh, watching Kevin Spacey and Jeff Goldblum in Speed the Plow, uh, David Mamet's uh, Hollywood satire. Now, at the time, Kevin Spacey could be on stage and that was fine. And he would instantly sell out the entire place. Uh, but I have never seen stage acting in quite like that. Um, the, the, the energy, the charisma, the, the humor, the physicality, uh, really understanding. David Mamet's difficult stuff to perform. Uh, that writing is hard. It's sort of hyper naturalism yeah. uh, heightened beyond all measure um, and I just have this memory there's a I don't know if people know that play it was it was the initial the first production quite famously had Madonna in it on Broadway in the late 80s and it was the moment towards the end where there are two characters, there are two film producers. I find it baffling that this was ever produced for people, for the general public to understand the difference between <laughs> an independent producer and a studio, a head of production at a studio. You'd think, how industry does this get? Um, yeah, it's so I don't know very inside baseball. In the, in the, it, and I think it was based on Art Linson and um, the head That's right. of... That's uh, right. I can't remember his name. I want to uh, say... A studio... Matt. Who, was sorry? it Paramount? I think it was Paramount, but I'm not positive. I think, I think, it, I think it was Paramount, but I can't yeah. remember the, 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 the guy's name, the, the, the head at the time. He was incredibly influential and powerful at the time. But it was based on discussions because I think Art Linson produced a, a couple of David Mamet films. And it was sort of a... But, but this character, the, the, produ the independent producer character... Um, Charlie Fox, which was played by Kevin Spacey, was uh, was appealing. Was get is getting the uh, the uh, the head of the 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 head of production play uh, the character Bobby Gould, played by. Right. Is it is, it, is that based on Robert Evans? Is it based no, on Robert it's Evans? Or it's after it's that, the right? It's later. Generation. It's yeah. the next generation. It's late eight, late yeah. eighties, um, and um, it's, the name's on the tip of my tongue. I can't. Yeah, remember. mine too. Enorm anyway. Um, so, and, and when, when he gets stabbed in the back, as inevitably all these relationships end in someone stabbing each other, stabbing the other person in the back, <laughs> um, but I'm just leading up to the moment that will forever stay in my mind was Kevin Spacey picking up the phone, the la the, 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 the landline on the desk and walloping Jeff Goldblum over the head, but to do that convincingly, but with such humor, but also kind of authentic and genuine aggression um, was just one of the most sort of uh, um, impactful things I've ever seen. In, in addition to saying this dialogue at, you know, at 50 miles a minute, um, uh, which 
just sings when you've got actors of that caliber saying them. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure you can. I'm not sure it's, it's probably deeply unfashionable to be praising these people at this point. But at the time, that must have been 2007, maybe. It, um, it could open up a whole conversation. Okay. Yeah, no, it could open up a whole conversation, which we will not have today about you know, how to deal with art of people who, um, you know, have been disgraced in one way or another, done terrible things, committed crimes, all this sort of stuff. We will not have that conversation today. Chris, I know that we have some of our uh, Dishwasher Diary gang in the audience. I think the time has come to invite them to ask Simon a few questions. Um, Simon, I'm hoping you have a few more minutes. Gabriel, seems to be very content uh so hopefully you got a few more minutes for us yeah yeah uh chris who's joining well if you look at the stage we have one of our all-time uh actually you know what we've got both of them our two big theater goer friends are here and fantastic I'm sure plenty to talk about and ask questions uh, jenny, jenny and lisa and go lisa. ahead chris sorry no, no, I was just I was just saying exactly what you said, Jenny and Lisa. I was just having a yeah, problem with the microphone. It popped me out. Jenny, I have, welcome. I have a few questions. Thank you. Simon, this is so fascinating. Um, one question I have, I live in Boston and New York. So Boston, when you go, so the show Life of Pi coming to Boston, are, is that something like you go? It sounds like you're there a long time. Or they're there a long time. So can we just talk about the process? For, yeah, we're there for 10 weeks. Um, That's so I long. See it. I, I will. See I will. It. I will. It. Um, oh, it's uh, at the AR. It is a lot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, cool. So, are you a are you a frequent patron of the ART? Yep. Yep. So, will oh, you be there, great. or is it they take over, or I how will. does that? Work? I will indeed. No, I will indeed. Oh, I'm cool. going out on December second for the for the final dress rehearsal and end of bits of tech, and then into previews. And I'll be there for the first half of December. Oh, that's until because we we open we open December fifteenth. Okay, I'll make sure to tell everyone. And the other question I had was: I saw you did Bad Jews in on the, in yeah. the West End, and also yeah, I'm gonna, and also admission. But I Bad Jews, I love that play. I love it so much. I, um, me too. How did that go over? It seems like to me like a very New Yorky play. So I just wanted to hear what no. how that. Went. No, it's not New York at all. I, would I mean, I'm sure it did go over, but I just want to yeah, hear how it's, it it's, it's, it's like. New York. It's New York in so far as it's set, you know, on the Upper West Side on a very specific block. But Josh, the magnificent writer of that, Josh Harmon, has said said that he and I think he 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 he's right about this that it manages to it managed to attain some universality by it being hyper specific. So. It, it wasn't a sort of general Jewish family, you know, it, it was, it was a bit like, um, I, I can equate the universality of that play to the famous story within the theater world of a Japanese producer, a Japanese theater producer saying to Hal Prince, uh, about Fiddler on the Roof that he couldn't believe Fiddler on the Roof worked in America because it was so, it was so Japanese, which is an oft quoted story yes so so there are very few families which have you know of of, of all faiths the, the the argument now for anyone who doesn't know bad jews which i <laughs> unfortunately is probably the vast majority of the world yeah. it, uh, it was yeah. only produced in new york off broadway although it did run for quite a while and then we did it in the west end we've done in the west end cumulatively it's done almost a year of performances um but it is about a, uh, some cousins in their 20s who are three cousins who are, well, two cousins in particular and a third who's sort of on the fence who are fighting over the inheritance of an heirloom. Just one second. Sorry. They're, they're fighting over the inheritance of an heirloom and one is deeply religious and the other is deeply secular. And he has brought his non-Jewish girlfriend to the house to the to the apartment this tiny studio on the upper west side and and the two cousins who are opposed uh battle it out in front of the the secular one's brother who is um as we learn at the end actually the most affected by the experience 
and this um, the uh, a non-Jewish woman from Delaware who uh, is, I suppose, meant to represent a sort of waspy girlfriend. Um, Steve, are you on? Are you on mute? I am on mute, and it's funny. I was just saying, oh, we can just call her a shiksa. It's the shiksa. We can, okay. Okay, so there's the shiksa, exactly. And she is called a shiksa in the play. Um, and and it's... Uh, it, so while people would say, well, that's a very Jewish setup, it, it, in every single culture, there is a, a, an equivalent. Um, and yeah. even where it's not a particular, even where there's not necessarily even religion involved, there will always be um, family. Uh, I guess in 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 Yiddish, it's the word bruges, but in uh, just disagreements which last a lifetime. How ridiculous they are! And the, the we're watching a moment in Bad Jews of uh, of two cousins who are never going to speak again after this moment. Um, oh yeah, because it's particularly yeah. it's particularly venomous. Maybe they'll it's see each venomous. other at a shi- at, at a shiver yeah. or a wedding at some place or a bar mitzvah down the line, maybe from across the room. But this is the moment that they have fallen out forever, um, and that's that's nothing Jewish about that. That's universal. Yeah, it's also a very funny play. I I just was impressed that you, you have a few Josh Harmons there, so that he's fantastic. So yeah, anyway, I'll let someone else. I did manage to catch it, Simon, during my six summers in London. Um, I did see Bad Jews, so I I, I, I got, and I also saw Layman Trilogy in both London and Los Angeles. Um, amazing. Um, Lisa, of are course, you also it with us? Amundsen, didn't it? It did, and I'm, I'm, I, I like you. I don't like to say anything bad about anyone, but I do have to say, um, there was a cast change that I felt um, maybe didn't. It did not go so well, at least the performance I saw. Um, but it is an amazing, amazing show. Um, Lisa, another huge theater fan. In fact, I'm going to New York next week. And I will be seeing Into the Woods with Lisa uh, in about a week. Welcome. <laughs> so excited. Yeah, that's going to be great. Um, um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Thanks so much for um, being with us and um, talking to us. And I also love hearing Gabriel in the background, I'm just going to say. Um, I, uh, <laughs> and I, I love that you're going to be at the ART and then come to New York because um, I live in New York, but um, I actually... Um, have seen quite a few things at the ART, so that's that's exciting. Now I'm like, maybe I'll need to go to Boston and see it with Jenny there, and then see you in New York. I um, feel like we should all go both. to Boston. Yes. Our, our our third big theater fan in our little family lives in Boston. I feel like we should all fly to Boston while Simon is there and see the show and and take him to dinner. I think that's such a great idea. I'll take you up I on that. You never, you never refuse a free dinner in this world. So definitely. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, we have enough time to plan that, right? Absolutely. So, it's so, a date. Okay. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Lisa. So I was going to say, I really love when we get um, shows from the West End here. Um, you know, I um, I loved King Charles III. That was great when that came. And, and also big fan of the Lehman Trilogy. Um, and then also I, last year I saw straight line crazy in, in London and it's going to be, it's in New York now. So I always, I like, I like when that gets transported. So I was just wondering what, you know, if you could talk a little bit about like your, your challenges that arise when you're, you know, going to, um, to do that, to bring it across the pond, um, and maybe like some kind of, maybe a hidden gem or something about, um, about that, you know, something you didn't expect. Well, I've only ever done it twice. Uh, uh, well, no, this is my second. Well, sort of twice before. This is my, kind of my third time. But both, but both times previously, it's been selling a production to a, a, a an institution such as Manhattan Theatre Club, which is very different from uh, um, taking commercial risk on on the big bad Great White Way, uh, which is what is happening with Life of Pi. Um, mm-hmm. So. 
uh, fortunately with this, there haven't been many challenges. Lots of people wanted to be involved. Lots of people wanted to invest. Uh, I've had the pick of, I've got two absolutely magnificent, uh, three absolutely magnificent sort of lead partners on the ground um, who, who I've brought on to, you know, because I'm not going to move to New York. Um, uh, and it's important to have people there. Um to have co-producers and uh, I um, so, so far there haven't been challenges I'm sure there are plenty of challenges ahead but we only went on sale a week ago so um, we only announced uh, yeah we only announced on Monday this week so um, uh, yeah. I no I, 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 I suppose I could discuss creative differences that there are some slight, I think, differences in flavour and taste to uh, the expectation of shows in in North America. Only slight, um, but we're just navigating those at the moment in script, in direction, in um, in in the in the the sort of glitz of it. You know, in London, we're in a fairly small theatre it's 700 seats um and that's you know we're, we're upsizing that in in new york so let's see I, I, as it happens it started when it started in sheffield in 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 north england in yorkshire um uh in 2019 it was a vast stage so i'm excited to see it on a big stage again um and i think it should it should work really well. It's important to get that feeling of a boy adrift on the ocean, which is more difficult when you've got a limited space. Uh, but we're going into the Schoenfeld, which is a relatively speaking, a wide theater. Right. Simon, Simon, are you bringing the London, although you're tweaking, are you bringing the London cast or is this a, a new production and you're staying up in London? In yeah, we're still up in London, and it's an entirely new cast uh, for, for for ART and then for Broadway. Fantastic. Go ahead, Lisa. Sorry. I was just going to say one more thing. As you said that it just announced, I have to say, as a theater watcher and involved in you know seeing all the announcements and the and the social media, it, you definitely you definitely got a good not to be too corny, but you got a big splash this week. <laughs> yeah. I must thank our publicists, but yes, I did. I think I think we uh, we made a bit of noise. It's difficult though. There are a lot of plays on this year, in this season. Yeah, and there's a, a lot, lot of new of stuff. Plays. But it's, it makes it all it makes it it makes it all exciting. I mean, people get really enthusiastic to see a lot, so I think it'll be great. I think so. Competition is going to be big in the spring. So well, I will definitely get the word out with the people I know. Please do. Thank you very much. We'll all be there, Simon. Uh, when I say we're going to take you to dinner, I'm not kidding. We will We will pick a day that works for everyone, and uh, I'll see you in Boston. Yeah, cheers. Excellent. Um, Chris? Yes. Have, are, are, we <laughs> able, are we able to bid farewell to Simon? I... I, unless you have something earth shattering to ask our esteemed guest, um, I think yeah, I think we've 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 used our time wisely with uh, Mr. Friend here. I uh, Simon, I, I know can, you see Gabriel is, is oh very, he's, very, he's content, he's content. Oh, you've been very you've been Simon. A good boy. He's been fantastic, and the the nursing sounds in the background were music to my ears, brings back memories. My uh, kids are just a little bit older. Um, <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you and I will be talking, you know, not only about the, the project we may be working on together, but also, as I mentioned to you, and now I'm going to mention it, you know, on the podcast, I am writing a musical. And the, the treatment is what I'm going to send you. You're you're going to become a, a, a producer of my show, and and uh, okay. that would that would make me a lucky boy. Well, send it over, Steve. 
Thanks so much for joining us, Simon. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, yeah. See you Pleasure. in Boston. See you there. Lovely to speak. And, uh, and, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Everyone who was listening. Take care, buddy. And thanks, this was Simon. great. Thank Thanks you. you soon. Bye. Yeah, great to hear from you. That was that was terrific. I know we have so many theater fans, and um, um, God, Layman, I loved listening to him talk about Layman trilogy and Speed the Plow because you know his passion for the work and and for the art is 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 really nice. You know, it's it's yeah, I love that he he both is very passionate about the art. Uh, but he's also very firmly rooted in the commercial realities of 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 putting these shows on, as he alluded to several times. So um, that that was really great. It what was I'd so like interesting, to- and I didn't know anything about him. I, I've been him personally, and yeah, go on. You were about to say something, but that was yeah, great. Just, was a great job. Su- super down to earth guy. He's a really nice guy. I love that he was feeding his three month old son Gabriel during the whole conversation. Because his uh, his wife's away at the the hen weekend, as they as they call them in the UK. Oh, wow. um, I want to quickly transition because I know she's here. I want to invite Felicity up. Our it, it's funny. It started out as a mistake, Felicity, and please get yourself up here. It started out as a mistake. I referred to you as instead of our woman on the street. Uh, I referred to you as our woman in the street. And now that's sort of stuck. Very soon, we are going to be sending you out for a dishwasher adventure of some kind. How are you, my dear? I'm, I'm great. I'm fantastic, even. You know, um, I'm, and I'm ready to be in the street or on the street. You're, we're going to put you in the street. Um, so, I don't know. Give us some kind of teaser. I think in our, in our next installment... We're sending you out it, by way of background. When we were on Clubhouse, Clubhouse. you you went out and you visited an appliance store. And I got to admit, I want to recreate that because it was gold. So yes. we got to get you out to an appliance store. What, what I don't know. What else? What streets are, are we going to send you out to? Or are you going to send yourself out to? I, you know, I, well... I mean, I'm hoping maybe to catch a Black Friday sale. You know what I mean? Ooh, right? wear armor. That could be dangerous, but I like that. Oh, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very well. They're not the same as they used to be, you know, not these days, man. I used to work at a very busy mall right next to an Apple store. And Black Friday was still scary. So I, I, I don't, not. I'm not sure about this. I'm not a hundred percent sure what I'm about to say is true. I'm thinking. I don't no no it can't be that I've never been out on Black Friday. I would say with with confidence I've never been like you know like at, like early in the morning like when the stores open and there's the rush. I'm sure I must have gone shopping at some point on 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 the Friday after Thanksgiving, but the people who get up at whatever time, I don't know if it's 4 in the morning or 6 in the morning or whatever it is. That's I've mad. seen all kinds. I've seen all kinds of things. I've had I've had plenty of years in in retail and in the mall. And I'm well, like, I'm only ashamed that you can't see like my really awesome interviewing microphone I've got going right well, now. Well, wait a second. We can. <laughs> can't we like, hold on. There's a way to do that. Are you, are you, are you camera oh, yeah, ready? No, I'm, I'm prepared. I came prepared. Okay. Hold on. Uh, Chris, somebody help me. Wait, there's a way to do this. Boom. Look. Invite to video. I just pressed the magic. And for prepared. those of you who, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> awesome. So for those of you who are listening on the podcast, I guess this would be a good time to say, we record live on Fireside, and on Fireside, we have video. So not only do you get to hear us, you get to see us, and you can chat with us, talk to our guests, whatever. Okay, I got to move into my camera to get a closer look. Wow. that Now, it's a bummer because... I can't really show my microphone. I like your blue neon thing. I have to take my phone off of my tripod. I'm doing it. And now wait, is there, I don't know how to do this other than to, here we go. Here we go. There we go. Fancy one. My fancy one is actually like hidden off camera, you see, and I'm just projecting. Oh, 
you see. Oh my God, that I'm Microsoft so stupid. <laughs> I'm so stupid. I thought that was some cool high tech microphone. So I've I moved something. Yes, yeah, I'm something of a performance art piece in human form on the internet. I'm so dumb. <laughs> I'm so dumb. If I somebody moved... that makes movies, Steve, you know how to ruin the magic of, 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 <laughs> I, the, of the image. I'm so stupid. I've missed you. I've missed you, Chris. <laughs> um, so I, there's my microphone. I had to move. I had to move my camera because my camera is in front. You know, is 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 in front of the microphone, so you can't see it. But there you go. There's my fancy microphone. I haven't now, can it. yeah? I want you. Launch I, stick yet, you know. I want to see. Oh no! Are you still there? I, I still want to see your fancy microphone. So I was too stupid to get that that wasn't it. So now I want to see the real thing. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. That's serious. Yeah. Oh, that puts my microphone to shame. Hello. I just had my microphone off as I was explaining uh, my, my setup. I was reaching for my earbuds. I'm like, I'm malfunctioning. I can't hear anything Felicity's saying. Yes, but I was it was all your fault. That I both like. I have both like my mentor who uh, for astrology, who's a little absent-minded. So I have it to both impress him, and I also have a friend that asked me to read him bedtime stories, and so I'm recording myself doing that also. <laughs> wow. I'm prepared. Well, I'm just saying well, that, you know, like a lot of people, there's a lot of fee to go around, you know, <laughs> and I'm here for the dishwashers. <laughs> All right. Well, we're ready to get you out in the street. So get to work. Next, okay. next installment, you're in the street. That will not be Black Friday. And then we're yeah. sending you back into the street for Black Friday. I wish that for this, I could play for you the voicemail message I left in an appliance, a high-end appliance store locally. That's like the oldest one in the area because I left like two messages because I kept talking so much. I sound psychotic or I sound drunk. I'm like, this isn't a joke. <laughs> I'm like, I'm very serious. I totally need to talk to someone about dishwashers. And um, they haven't called me back. I wonder why. You're going to just, I think you should just show up. I just, yeah, I try to be nice to like, uh, you know, I look at the little, you know, see if they're busy. I keep forgetting my joke microphone. <laughs> I like your joke microphone. Thank um, you. Thank you. Chris, and Chris, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think we have a dishwasher diaries newbie to interview today about their dishwasher loading. So we, we may just have to make do with Simon's very um, appropriate discussion. I mean, Simon had some ideas. I mean, he had thought it through. Yeah, well, we, we don't have anybody new, but I do have some dishwashing news for you. You did mention that at the outset. And in typical Steve Crone fashion, I completely forgot. That's dishwasher okay. news from Chris. What is happening in the world of dishwashing? So I have been volunteering at my nephew's school during uh, helping out with their, uh, their lunch because they've been short staffed. So one of oh, the things that they've had, one of the things they've had me doing, I have moments. One of the things they had me doing is washing the dishes. Can I tell you, <laughs> I've never used an industrial dishwasher before. Uh, and it's more, it's a sink they can't get right? or do they have a three compartment sink or so basically like... so basically what the setup that they've got is they've got one of those like they've got a big sink with like the big power washer that's just basically like a hose that you're sure you're just spraying everything down with on the that you're putting on the trays that get fed into the dishwasher right and then you slide it into the dishwasher and you it's just a rack and you pull it shut huh. And it just hits it with like hot water and sanitizer for, you know, however long that is, a minute or two. And then you, so you have the full on, it's, this is the full on commercial where it's like the plastic rack thing. It doesn't yep. look anything like a home dishwasher. Yeah. We're talking yep. full commercial. That's Absolutely. crazy that they put you in the, on the dishwasher as a volunteer. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm hel- I help out with like distributing the food too, but yeah, then afterwards it's just like, it's just kind of a, I, I just kind of slid over to that. And so I'm promoted. I'm cleaning the, di- yeah, I'm doing the dishes and like, they're all like, Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're, we've got you doing this. I'm like, don't be, this is great. And oh I'm my like, God. Chris. So I, now I want to ask you questions. So first of all, I have questions too. After, after using the commercial dishwasher, where you just slide the whole thing in and blast it. Like you said, like, are you like, are you now like I'm, I'm ruined. I can't use a home dishwasher anymore. This thing is fucking amazing. Like, is it, is it, what, what's that like? The most frustrating thing of you, of washing dishes at home now is that the sink doesn't have the pressure of basically a fire hose <laughs> when you're, <laughs> when you're rinsing, when you're rinsing them off first. And you do have to rinse on the industrial dishwasher right? because right. it's not, it's not like a, a, a regular at home dishwasher because there's so much food caked on these things from sure you know, coming back. So you have to get that off. I mean, the, the dishwasher itself is really just for like sanitizing. The last thing. Like are, are, you, exactly. are, you are you doing a food ahead, safe, please. like three sink wash? I'm like, I'm dying as a food safety person. I'm like, Ugh. like, are you like, you know, like what you're supposed to like rinse, like fire hose in one sink and then like wash it with soap and water and then sanitize as like a third step. Well, so, state the, you're in. No, but I think that's when you don't have the machine, Felicity. If you do the no, three-step hand use, wash. You still have to use the machine because the machine just sanitizes. Food safety wow. is right, so right here, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead, food Chris. Safety. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I've never worked in, in food service. I don't know what state you're in, though. So I'm in Colorado. I own a restaurant, sir. <laughs> so basically, like, you're spraying them off, and then you're putting yeah. them in, and it hits it with the hot water, and then it has like another step where it feeds that like a, another little cycle where it sprays some other stuff on it. No further questions. Um, I'm. Uh, yes, no problem. But, okay. I got yeah, a question. It, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm fat. This is amazing. I... Yeah. It, it's, it's a whole new world. Like it's, I'm, so... they, they, they don't, I, I'm wearing a mask at the school because it's like, you know, forget about worrying about anything else kids are just little petri dishes and i don't need to be yeah. sick every other day yeah. um yeah. but I, i'm just grinning ear to ear behind the damn mask the entire this, time this is incredible okay so i have a question about the the blasting yeah. step um we, you know one of the lyrics in our theme song is have you ever cleaned out your food trap so th- th- most of the food as you say or pretty much all of it is coming off in the sink yeah when you blast it what then is it going down? Like, is there just like an industrial strength garbage disposal? That is exactly it- what it is. No, that is exactly what it is. And it's great because the, the way that it's set up is um, it is, it's an, an industrial grade food uh, or garbage disposal. But it's funny because the handle to turn it on is like below, you know, like in the movies, when you see them like on a ship or something, and they use that lever to make, make it go full speed ahead it's like that <laughs> it's just like it's like a little hand crank that you just push to the side and it's like and the whole thing yeah it's but does it does it ring no i'm just kidding that's only in the movies on boats this is that the dishwasher I, it's a, it's news i expected but this is the dishwasher news we deserve exactly this is like <laughs> i i mean chris and i did not talk about this in advance i had no idea that my dishwasher diaries interview today was going to be with my producer who is now the dishwasher at ps xxx in in yeah. in colorado that is nuts um okay yeah. do you wear it sounds messy do they give you a really nice waterproof apron of some kind to I've got, put over I've, yourself? I've got on yeah i've got on something like over the top of it's like it they've given me stuff to like yeah, it, it, it's a, it's not quite a, what do they call them? Like those sort of jackets that you wear in the kitchen, Felicity, you know what I'm talking about? I was like, just going to ask, her, I, I don't remember, but I was going to ask if you could dress like Paddington Bear one week. But it is, it, I don't know, it is. I was going to say I like a have... long John Silver type uh, raincoat, rain, rain slicker, uh, a poncho. I look like the Gordon's Fisherman. A, no, the Gordon's I... The Gordon's Fisherman, yeah. Boots. No, yeah, I, boots too. It's just a, no, I, I, they've got you know they gave me like a like a cap 
like I've got a baseball cap and I've got that's got like whatever their logo is on it and I've got like a uh God, like, a, like a lab coat type thing that they wear in the kitchens. Yeah. We all covered so back we, there. I always say I don't know anything about dishwashing really, other than what we've learned by like looking shit up. But now we have an actual semi professional dishwasher in our midst. I feel like I've gone under it's like it's like Undercover. <laughs> it's like undercover. It's nuts. It's nuts. And it's not like you volunteered knowing that you would wind up being the dishwasher. This is just like kismet. It's unbelievable. I know. And I and I get so excited about it. And I, you know, I, I'll, I'll like I'll talk about it, and they're like, what, "What? You're washing the dishes. This isn't." Yeah. That. What's your major malfunction? I'm like, you don't understand. I talk about washing dishes all the time with people. My God, that and then, is fantastic. I get that from people too. I talk, I get that. And then people always like to say, like, what's the best dishwasher? What's the Ferrari of dishwasher? It's like, who cares? I was like, oh, good. Well, the, we have an answer. And, <laughs> yeah, but we don't really care. The other thing yeah. this week is that, uh-huh. so I, then I, I, you know, after that, then I came home and I was emptying the dishwasher at home and the spray arm, as I opened it up, <laughs> The spray arm from the that sits under the top rack, yeah, fallen off and was in the dishes on the bottom rack. What? Re- so I had to reassemble the spray arm. Wait a second. You're now the official dishwasher at the school, and you're a dishwasher repairman at home. Yes, it's been quite the week for dishwashing, Steve. This is incredible, Chris. I can't think of a better way to end. I do want to say, speaking of spray arms, however, I love Simon even like getting into the like the worst thing you can do is blow. He didn't know it was called a spray arm, but that's okay, right? It's he's not he's new to the dishwasher batteries gang, but I love that he got into like you know make sure you don't block the thingy at the top that spins around. By the way, as a connoisseur of these interviews, I thought he was I thought it was one of the best I'd ever heard. Just his detail and the way he thought about it and what he said and. It was fantastic. I was the actually con- surprised because con- I thought, could I ever hear dishes. anything new? No, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I mean, I think back through the interviews in the podcast. Jenny Lumet with her, the precious items need yes. to go in the top rack. Yes. And it was like her heroes of the Torah <laughs> yes. cups. Or, I, I, I hey, mean, you want to go to that store Jeff- when you're in New York? You can go to that store where she got those. The, the store where she got the hero of the tower. Yeah, okay, we, we got it. We got to do that. We got to do that. Absolutely. Um, okay, I think we're going to close the book on this installment. Check us out on Spotify and Apple and everywhere else there are podcasts. If you want to join us live, Fireside is the place. We record on Fireside live, audio and video. And I think there's nothing left to do except thank all of you. Thank my special guest, Simon Friend. Thank my wonderful producer, Chris Seacott. And of course, replay the second greatest song ever written by the wonderful brother, Sam Lange. And off we go. You know what, Chris? Invite everybody up on stage. Come on, guys. Come sing along with us today. Come on, everybody. Raise your hand. Come on up. We're going to sing it together. Off we go. And a one and a two and a three. Do you wash my hand? By a machine, do you rinse your dish or do you leave it in the same soaking dishwasher queries for people all over the world? Bring your questions, then come and meet my friends. Dishwasher Diaries Have you ever cleaned out your food trap? 
Uh, have you ever researched all the brands of the product you're using? We will investigate the best way to dry your plates. Bring your questions there. Come and meet my friends, dishwasher diaries. Dishwasher diaries. Woo. Dishwasher Diaries was recorded with a live studio audience. Created live on Fireside.